Uh, in this topic, we will explore further voltaic and electrolytic cells, which we first met in the SL topic uh, for this unit. And in particular, you will see the role of the standard electropotentials play in both types of electrochemical cell. The electrolysis of aqueous solutions will also be discussed in this topic, as well as the quantitative aspects of electrolysis. And these are the learning objectives. Okay, so uh, what a voltaic cell generates, what the standard hydrogen electrode is, uh, when aqueous solutions are electrolyzed, what happens, uh, we'll interact with delta G uh, and discuss it in terms of electrical uh, cells, uh, current duration of, electro of electrolysis uh, and the charge of iron effect on electrolysis will be discussed and we'll look at electroplating. So by the end of the unit you should be able to calculate cell potentials uh, using standard electric potentials, predict whether a reaction will be spontaneous using these values, determine the standard free energy changes of these electropotentials, explain products formed during electrolysis, perform a lab experiment which could include single displacement reactions, determine the relative amounts of products formed during electrolysis, and explain the process of electroplating. The first thing we're going to look at is cell potentials. So this is a little bit of physics for you, uh, and electromotive force, EMF. Okay, so a voltaic cell, which we looked at previously, produces a potential difference known as AEMF. Okay, the voltage essentially is the electromotive force. And the cell potential, or electropotential E, is measured by comparing it to a standard, which is known as the standard hydrogen electrode, or SHE. So the way I would consider looking at EMF is through an analogy, okay? The idea of an EMF or potential difference can be difficult to understand. However, this analogy hopefully will uh, help. So essentially, imagine you have two water barrels. Okay, so here is a water barrel one, okay? And this is water barrel two, okay? So we'll call this imaginatively barrel A and barrel B. And they have two different uh, volumes of water. Okay, so one has quite high, one is quite, well, reasonably lower. Okay, so I must make that a little bit lower there, right? So the two are connected by the pipe, obviously, you see before you. Okay, and when the connecting pipe is opened, the water will flow from the barrel where the water, water is highest, in this case barrel A, uh, through the open pipe to barrel B where the water level is less. Okay, so basically what's going to happen is that water will flow and then of course the water level will increase. Okay, so that's essentially the idea of potential difference. Uh, the water will flow from one barrel A, where the water level is higher, to the pipe, to barrel B, where the water level is lower. Barrel A could be described as having a greater potential energy than barrel B. So that's one way of looking at it. And the potential difference, of course, is going to be the difference before you've opened the tap. Okay, so that would be the EMF, I guess. Okay, or, or voltage. Okay, so in a voltaic cell, a cell potential is generated resulting in the moving electrons from an anode to the cathode via the circuit. Okay, and the cell potential is then defined as the potential difference between the cathode and anode when the cell is operating. Okay, and the cell potential also depends on the concentrations of the species involved under standard temperature and pressure. So under standard conditions, which are one mole per decimeter cubed, okay, so one mole per decimeter cubed, okay, uh, at 100 kilopascals, okay, in terms of pressure, uh, for gaseous reactions, okay, so it's for gases, okay, it's of course it's one atmosphere for non gaseous uh, reactants. The standard cell potential is termed the standard, well, the cell potential is called the standard cell potential, okay. 
Notice that's, that's your standard part. Okay. So let's have a look at the standard hydrogen potential of which all these standard potentials are measured against. So the standard electropotential E0 are the potential values determined by comparison with this particular hydrogen electrode, which is the potential created by one mole of hydrogen ions at 100 kilopascal hydrogen at 298K. And it has an E0 value of 0, 0.00 volts. Because it's not possible to measure uh, the electro potential of a single half cell, you have to use the standard hydrogen electrode. And it's a universal reference electrode and is known as a gas electrode. Okay, therefore, the standard electro potential is the potential or voltage of the reduction half equation under standard conditions measured relative to this particular standard hydrogen electrode. The potentials of other electrodes are then compared to this particular reference at the same temperature and therefore the reduction half equation corresponding to the half cell is going to be, as we see at the bottom here, uh, the 2H plus plus 2 electrons giving hydrogen. Okay, the standard electropotential of another half cell is then determined by simply connecting the half cell under standard conditions to the standard hydrogen electrode using connecting wire with a voltmeter attached and a salt bridge. And the cell potential can there then be considered or determined. So this is how we um, basically measure these E0 values. So here we're using zinc and zinc sulfate solution. Okay. So what's happening, of course, is that in the diagram, the standard hydrogen electrode is shown coupled to the zinc half cell, and the voltmeter reading gives a standard electrode potential for the zinc cell. Okay, and the standard conditions are temperature of 298 Kelvin, one mole concentration, and for gases, for example, the hydrogen, it's 100 kilopascals. And the salt bridge, we fill with saturated potassium chloride solution, which allows the uh, circuit to be completed. Okay, so what ends up happening is you develop a se uh, an electrochemical series, a series of uh, voltages, um, for each of the uh, reduction uh, half equations, or uh, yeah, reduction half equations, in re relative to the standard hydrogen elec uh, electrode, okay. And the further you go up, the more positive E naught is, the reaction is more likely to work. Okay, so more positive, more likely to work. And the species on the left are more powerful oxidation agents. Okay, so that makes sense because fluorine we now know is quite a strong oxidizer, whereas the zinc iron is quite poor, okay, because the corresponding metal, zinc, is quite a good reducing agent. That kind of makes sense. So if the species are arranged in order of their standard electron potentials, you get a series that shows how good each particular substance is in. Uh, gaining electrodes. Sorry, gaining electrons. And all reactions are written as reduction processes, i.e. the gaining of electrons in the electrochemical series. Okay. And the species with a high E0 value, as you can see, uh, oxidizes or reverses the one with a particular lower value. Okay, so all we're doing here is working out the electrochemical series. Okay, so how do you apply that? How do you apply it? Well, essentially an equation with a higher E0 value will reverse an equation with a lower value. So let's apply that for an example here. So chlorine um, is a more powerful oxidizing agent. Okay, so we can see it obviously here. It's highlighted in blue. Okay, it has a higher E0 than chlorine. So, oh, sorry, it's higher in E0 than um, iodine, okay, which we have here, okay. So that means that chlorine will get its electrons by reversing the iodine reaction, okay. So it's going to be chlorine, it's going to go to chloride, and basically it's going to be 2 iodide going to iodine. So the overall equation will be chlorine plus 2 iodide giving 
iodine plus two chloride ions. Okay, so here are some quite uh, powerful redox couples. Okay, so the species at the top, they will be reduced and gain electrons. So that basically they're increasingly powerful oxidizing agents as you go down. And it's the opposite. On the other side of the reduced form, it's going to be increasingly powerful reducing agents because they will be oxidized and lose electrons. So how do you predict these uh, E0 values? Well, the E0 value can be used to predict the feasibility of redox and cell reactions. Okay, in theory, any redox reaction with a positive uh, E0 value will work. However, in practice, it proceeds if E0 value of the reaction is greater than about 0.4 volts. And an equation with a more positive E0 value will reverse a less positive one. Okay, so let's see how that works in practice. What happens if uh, basically tin metal uh, and copper metal, uh, well, the, the tin, tin 2 plus um, cells and the copper, copper 2 plus cells are connected? Will it be a spontaneous reaction? Will you get uh, a voltage forming? Will it work? Okay, so pause the video now and see if you can work out how to do that. Okay, so the first thing you have to do is write out the equation. So copper 2 plus going to copper has an E0 of plus plus three four volts, whereas the tin 2 plus going to two electrons is going to be uh, going to, go, going to tin has an E0 value of minus 0.14 volts. The half reaction with the more positive E0 value is more likely to work. Okay, so this one here, the copper 2 plus going to copper metal. Okay. If it gets the electrons by reversing the half reaction with the lower E0 value. Okay. Therefore, copper 2 plus aqueous will go to copper and tin will go to tin 2 plus because now you're going to be reversing this half equation here. Okay, so the overall reaction is copper 2 plus going to tin, or plus tin going to uh, tin 2 plus and copper metal. And the sole voltage will be the difference of the E0 values. Okay, so the way we'd write that as an equation would be that the, the E0 cell will equal the E0 of the right hand electrode, okay, that's what RHE is, minus the E0 of the left hand electrode, okay. And of course, uh, basically, uh, the ERHE represents the standard electrode potential of the cathode, uh, which by convention is taken as the right-hand side electrode. And of course, ELHE represents the standard electrode potential of the anode, which by convention is taken to be the left-hand side of the electrode in a voltaic, volta voltaic cell. Okay, so if we do that, then it's going to be plus 0.34, Okay, remembering that um, reduction happens at the cathode. Okay, and subtracting naught or negative uh, 0.14. Okay, because uh, oxidation occurs at the left hand electrode. Okay, so that means that the total cell voltage E naught cell will be 0.48 volts which is going to be greater than our 0.4 volts, which we said is uh, kind of the rule of thumb to see if it's going to work. So that means that the value is positive, it's going to go, it'll be spontaneous. Okay, so now we're going to look at Gibbs free energy and how it also relates to uh, electrochemical cells. So the electro potential uh, E0 and the free energy change delta G. Okay, so the equation that uh, you need to know is delta G naught, okay, uh, the Gibbs free energy change under standard conditions equals negative N F E naught, where N is the number of moles and F is a constant called Faraday's constant of the great uh, physicist Michael Faraday, and it's charge per mole and it's going to be 96,500 uh, charges per mole, okay. 
So for non-standard conditions, we use the Nernst equation, which is found in the data booklet, which is E equals E0 minus RT divided by NF natural log of Q. Okay, but we tend to be using standard conditions because it really does uh, uncomplicate things. Okay, so if delta G0 is negative, the reaction is spontaneous under these standard conditions. Okay, so here's a problem. Calculate the Gibbs free energy for the following voltaic cell as standard conditions. Okay, so it's going to be the uh, SN4 plus uh, ion gaining two electrons to become SN2 plus. It's given an E0 of 0.015. And Fe3 plus plus electron is going to be uh, Fe2 plus. It's going to have an E0 of 0.77 volts. So try and work out uh, what the Gibbs free energy is for the following voltaic cell, okay, using the equation from the last slide. Right, so this is what you should have got, okay, so E0 equals E0 cathode minus uh, E0 anode, or E0 right-hand side minus E0 left-hand side, so it's going to be 0.77 minus 0.015, which is 0.62 volts, okay, so far so good, it should, should work, okay, and delta G uh, it's going to be uh, NFE, so it's going to be um, 2 moles of electrons times 96,500 charges per mole times 0 0.62 volts. So it's going to be uh, 11,960 right? no. 11, volts per coulomb. Of course, we know that volts per coulomb from your physics is going to be to a joule. Okay, so it's going to be negative, important, negative 1.2 times 10 to the 2 kilojoules. And because delta G uh, naught is going to be negative, the reaction is going to be spontaneous under standard conditions. Okay, so the next thing we have to look at is going to be um, products of electrolysis. Okay, so in inert electrolysis, these are the general predictions which we looked at very briefly in uh, the SL uh, topic of this unit. If the uh, metal is high in the reactivity series, you will get hydrogen. Okay, if the metal is low, you will just continue to get the metal. Okay, and if the halide solution is concentrated, you will get a halogen, either chlorine, bromine, or iodine, where, whereas with other common negative ions, you will get oxygen. So, for example, hydroxide uh, and sulfate. So those are our, our basic predictions. Right, so the products of electrolysis. So at the cathode, you will form um, a metal or hydrogen, and at the anode, you will form either a non-metal or form oxygen or the oxidation of the electrode. And a case being, uh, if you have carbon as your electrode, then it's going to be oxidized to carbon dioxide. Okay, and this is where we can use standard electron potentials to determine the products of electrolysis in um, four simple steps. Okay, so the first thing you have to do is determine which products go to the cathode and which are going to go to the anode. For the cathode, determines which cation has the most positive electrode potential. Okay, this will uh, be reduced, it'll gain electrons, and the higher the positive potential value, the more naturally a reaction will occur. Okay, so atom plus the electron will give a, a negative ion. For the anode, okay, it's going to be the reverse of the cathode. Okay, so you reverse the reactions and electro potential values, so negative becomes positive, positive becomes negative, for determining which is the most positive and likely to occur, because you've got the ion going to a positive, um, ion going to an atom, okay, so it's going to be an atom and an electron. Okay, so include all your setting out. And what we're going to do now is just go through some examples, okay, to work out what's going to happen in each of these particular situations. So let's now look at the electrolysis of copper sulfate in a solution, so aqueous. Okay, so first thing is that we use an inert electrode, and the formula for aqueous copper 2 sulfate, of course, is CuSO4. So the first thing we do is we consider the species present at each electrode. Okay, so at the cathode, we're going to have the copper 2 plus floating about, 
and also we're going to have a lot of water because it's going to be in solution. Okay, then at the anode, the positive electrode, we're going to have the sulfate. Okay, and again, water. So the next thing we do is let's look at the next uh, possible half equations that may take place at the cathode. Okay, so at the cathode or negative electrode, reduction takes place. So with reduction, that's gaining of electrons. So we have copper 2 plus gaining electrons to become copper, which has an E naught value of plus 3, 4 volts. Okay, and water can gain an electron to become hydrogen and hydroxide. Okay, uh, and that has a value of negative uh, 0.83 volts. So you can see from the cathode, the most positive is going to be the plus 0.34, the most likely. So it'll be copper 2 plus gaining an electron to become copper. Okay. So that means that reduction with the more positive E0 value will be favoured. So that's what's going to happen. Okay. This guy here is going to happen, this, this, this reaction. Okay. So then we have the positive uh, electrode, the anode. Oxidation is going to uh, occur here. Okay, so you'll notice I have not included the sulfate half equation because sulfates do not tend to oxidize. In sulfate, the oxidation state of sulfate is plus six, corresponding to the stable noble gas core of neon, which won't want to give up. Okay, there's stability in that. Okay, so at the anode, the following reaction therefore takes place, the only one that's available. It's going to be the water going to oxygen plus two protons and losing two electrons. And even though it's negative 1.23, it's the most positive of the options you have when you only got one option. Okay, so then what we do is we've now got the two um, half equations for the electrodes. We combine them to give the overall equation of copper 2 plus going to plus water, giving to copper metal plus oxygen, two protons, and the overall uh, potential of the cell being negative 0.89 volts. Okay, notice it's negative, so it probably ain't going to be spontaneous. So the next one we're looking at is the uh, electrolysis of sodium chloride in aqueous solution. Okay, so unlike electrolysis of molten sodium uh, chloride, which we looked at uh, in the earlier subtopic, the electrolysis of concentrated aqueous sodium chloride, there is an additional species to be considered, namely the fact you've got water because it's aqueous. Okay, so just like in the previous example, let's just break down what you will find. So there'll be ions of sodium, there'll be ions of chloride, and of course there'll be lots and lots of water. So at the cathode, you're going to have sodium ions and water, and at the anode, you're going to have chlorides and water. Okay, so basically you've got the four possible half equations, and now we're going to share them at the cathode and the anode. Okay. So at the cathode, uh, either water is going to gain an electron to form hydrogen and hydroxide, or sodium ions are going to gain an electron to become sodium metal. And you can see that even though they're both negative, negative 0.83 is a more positive than negative 2.71. So at the cathode, what's going to happen is that water is going to be split, and it's going to form hydrogen and hydroxide. And at the anode, you've either got water uh, forming oxygen and protons, or chloride forming chlorine gas and an electron. Okay, and you can see that the most positive is going to be water splitting to form oxygen. So it's negative 1.23. That's most positive, but there's always a but. Okay, so the but is that for concentrations greater than 25% uh, sodium chloride, chlorine ends up being formed. Okay. And the reason for this is that for concentrated aqueous sodium chloride solutions, this is not as simple as the, uh, the numbers suggest. We have a system thing called overvoltage, okay? Overvoltage. Okay? In the electrolysis experiment, uh, in any electrolytic experiment, the applied potential needed to carry out the electrolysis is always greater than the potential calculated from the standard potentials that we've been using. This extra difference in the potential or voltage is called the overvoltage. Many reactions taking place at electrodes are extremely slow. Therefore, the additional voltage effectively is an extra voltage required for a reaction with a slow rate to proceed at a reasonable rate. 
So as a result, the oxidation reaction taking place at the anode would actually require a potential greater than 1.23 volts to occur. Okay, and the over voltage for oxygen gas formation is quite high compared to that for chlorine gas. This suggests that at the anode, in a concentrated solution of sodium chloride, greater than 25%, the chloride ions are actually reduced to chlorine gas, which is actually what we do observe experimentally. Note, however, this can only be confirmed through experiment. Still, in the case of dilute aqueous solution of sodium chloride, over voltage does not play such an important part, so therefore we can still rely on these particular values. Okay, so for a concentrated solution of sodium, aqueous sodium chloride, called brine, uh, you end up forming chlorine. For a dilute solution, then you're going to form uh, oxygen. Okay, because you get the final equation then uh, for solutions greater than 25% uh, sodium chloride of water plus two chloride ions giving chlorine gas, nice green gas uh, at the anode, and hydrogen plus two hydroxides. And the final one we're going to look at is the electrolysis of water. Okay, so water can be electrolyzed with a weak sulfuric acid, okay, or a weak acid. I've chosen sulfuric acid for this. So if you just use a drop of uh, sulfuric acid, then you're going to have sulfate ions in solution, you're going to have water in solution, and you're going to have protons in solution. Okay, so the, the two half equations uh, that you're going to look at are going to be oxygen gaining electron to form water or hydrogen uh, gaining electron to form or protons gaining electron to form hydrogen which of course is your standard hydrogen electron electrode anyway so it's going to have a zero okay so we don't consider sulfate for the reasons outlined earlier so at the cathode you've got protons um, gaining electrons to become hydrogen which is going to be zero which is the most positive of your options because you only got one and the anode is going to have water forming ox uh, oxygen and two hydrogens, okay, which is going to be most positive. Again, you've only got one option. So basically, water gets split into oxygen and hydrogen. That's pretty straightforward. So the factors affecting the relative amounts of products and electrolysis, well, you can consider the charge of ion, okay. So as the uh, charge increases, the amount of product decreases, and as the charge uh, in decreases, the amount of product increases. And the current flowing through the circuit, as you uh, increase the current, the amount of product increases because you're providing more uh, electrical energy. And if you decrease it, the amount of product decreases. And the longer you uh, allow electrolysis to occur, the amount of product increases. And obviously, the shorter time you do the reaction, the amount of products decreases. And another example is going to be uh, electroplating. It's quite a common use of uh, electrolysis. Okay. And what is electroplating? Well, electroplating, essentially, as you can see, is in this particular example, you have some pure um, silver as the uh, positive anode. Okay, you've got silver nitrate possibly as your electrode, and you have the the metal that you wish to electroplate forms the the cathode, negative cathode. Okay, so you, you apply currents, and what's going to happen is that at the silver anode. Uh, the silver metal is going to form silver ions and electrons, okay, so it'll get smaller. And basically the silver nitrate solution, the silver ions in the solution, the electrolyte, are going to gain electrons and then deposit on your, um, your metal um, cathode as, metal, uh, as silver metal. That's going to be reduction. So essentially in electroplating, the item to be coated is placed on the negative uh, electrode, so the metal cations will be reduced. The anode, uh, anode may be a metal block. Uh, often the solution is cyanide, so it's quite an exciting uh, reaction to do uh, because you, you've got cyanide involved. Uh, the anode dissolves uh, and releases the cations in solution, as we saw in the, in the diagram uh, in the previous slide, 
and temperature current, uh, what the actual metal is made of, and the concentration of the solution are all rigorously controlled. And in terms of applications, well, electroplating can be applied in many ways, but here's just four examples. Okay, so uh, jewellery, the cheaper to coat with gold uh, than make out of pure gold. Tin cans, it's because coating the tin protects the cans from rust because it's uh, kind of a sacrificial metal. Uh, car parts and tools, coating with nickel and chromium decreases friction, preventing rust, makes it look pretty as well. And galvanising, uh, again, coating this time with zinc metal to prevent uh, rusting of the iron. And it's used in car bodies, pipes, wire and sheeting, and also boats quite a lot. Okay, so the last thing we're going to touch upon is quantitative electrolysis, or Q equals IT, where Q is in charge, measured in coulombs, uh, I is current, measured in amps, and T is time, of course, measured in seconds. So what we're going to do now is just basically break down the different components, okay, you've got either current, okay, so in terms of current, then um, current is of course equal to the amount of charge passing by in a unit of time, okay, so it's basically coulombs per second, okay, and since current is proportional to uh, the charge, okay, that means that that current will also be proportional to the number of electrons passing through an external circuit. Okay, so for example, for aluminium 3 plus, to generate one mole of aluminium solid, you need three moles of electrons. Okay, so aluminium 3 plus, you're going to need three moles of electrons. Okay, and if current is doubled at time t, Q will be doubled and hence the number of electrons will be doubled. This then means that the amount in mole of aluminium will increase. Okay, so increasing charge increases the amount of uh, aluminium that's going to be forming. Okay, that's, that's one example there. Okay, so that's, that's current sorted out. Okay, so T is also important. So from the equation, you can see that the T is proportional to the charge as well. This means that uh, T will also be directly proportional to the number of electrons passing through the external circuit. So the longer you run, the more electrons you're going to be passing through. Okay, and then the other thing you've got to consider is uh, Z, okay, which is the charge on a ion, okay. Um, and for the amount in mole of electrons needed to discharge one mole of iron, at an electrode uh, is equal to the charge on the ion, okay? And this is termed Faraday's law. So I'm just going to write that down, okay? So what Faraday's law is, okay? So this is known as Faraday's law, okay? It's basically the amount which is going to be in moles okay, of electrons needed to discharge or release, I guess, one mole of an ion, okay, can be any ion, is equal to its charge. Okay, Z. And that's known as Faraday's, oh, second law. Okay, so that's Faraday's second law. Okay. So just to finish off, here's a example. So calculate the mass in grams of copper produced when a current of 1.5 amps is passed through a solution of aqueous copper sulfate for 3.25 hours. So pause the video now and see what you can work out. Okay, so let's go back. So what we want to do is we want to calculate the mass, okay, and we've got a current, and it's going to be 
copper two, maybe somewhere involved, and 3.25 hours. Now, obviously, 3.25 hours, that needs to be converted to seconds. That's the first thing I'm thinking. So, this is how I would do it. So, Q equals IT. Okay, so it's going to be 1.5 amps times 3.25 hours times 60 minutes an hour times 60 minutes per second. So that's the conversion from hours to seconds. So it's going to be about 17,550 coulombs. Okay, so basically from uh, the Faraday's constant, uh, 9,000, this is basically 9,060, uh, 16,500. So 96,500 coulombs per mole. Okay, that means you're going to have basically 0.1813 moles of electrons. And the equation, of course, is going to be copper 2 plus, gaining 2 electrons to form copper metal. So 2 moles of electrons for 1 mole of copper, but you don't have 2 moles of electrons. You've only got 0.183 moles of electrons. So therefore, X is going to be 0.9910 moles of copper. No, the mass of copper equals number of moles of copper times the molar mass, or at least the atomic mass of, of copper. So it'll be 0.9910 moles times 63.55 grams per mole, so 5.78 grams of copper. And that's basically all you have to know for IB when it comes to electrochemistry.